Stay tuned for the Joan Quinn Profiles. Joan served the state of California as a member on the Arts Council and on the Film Commission. She was formerly on the Architectural Commission and fulfilled two terms on the Fine Arts Commission for the city of Beverly Hills. As an editor for Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine, Condé Nast Publications, and the Hearst Corporation, Joan covered the world of fashion, the mysteries of food, the excitement of theater, and the international art scene. She continues to find people who are on the cutting edge of their professions. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. We're at the Hollywood Museum as the guest of Danelle Dadigan, and this museum is housed in the historic landmark Max Factor building. Here waiting to be profiled are author Ellen Levy Sarnoff and artist potter Adam Silverman. Writer, producer, novelist Ellen Levy Sarnoff was born and raised in New York, graduated from Wellesleyan University and went on to earn a master's in communication at the University of Pennsylvania. After school you were in New York. You had a great job at NBC. Mm -hmm. What were you doing? Well, it wasn't that great a job, <laughs> but it was a fun job. I was very bi coastal. I was, I was a researcher, so uh -huh. I, I tested different TV shows, from game shows to sitcoms to dramas to nighttime talk shows. I had the privilege of being the first to see people react to Eddie Murphy, and he was a breakthrough star. So was that what you could do out of college? You knew what was happening enough to test? You know, I had studied research at the University of Pennsylvania at the oh. Annenberg School, so I had a good foundation I for see. interviewing people and analyzing statistics and doing focus groups. I did a lot of focus groups, I see, I which see. was very fascinating. And what did you do? Get a group of people together and ask them questions? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And believe me, everyone has an opinion. <laughs> but did you write the questions? I wrote the questions. Oh, see, yeah, I but see. I worked with the producers because there were always issues to get at. You know, was the show funny? Oh, did they I find see. the characters engaging? So a lot of the research was used for diagnostic, to make the show better, or to see if it, it was going to fly or not fly. And why did you move to Los Angeles when you were doing, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, it was, and I was bi-coastal, <laughs> you know, people had a half share in the Hamptons, I had a half share at the Beverly Hills Hotel, it was fun, not you know, bad. it was fun, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> I had a creative bug in me, I, 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 I had a creative bug, I ended up creating a game show. I had tested so many, said, oh, I can do that. And oh, because you were in contact with yeah. all of those producers, producers. early on, knowing whether they were going to work or not. Exactly. So I came up with an idea for a game show. and You did a lot of productions with family and children. A lot. TV. That's my First, specialty. Yeah. Is it? Always. And, yeah. and how did that happen? Kind of just fell into it. Family? You know? I mean, uh, were you in, from a big family? No, no, no. I just, I don't know, I just fell into it at NBC. I ended up being the first to test Smurfs and those little cute blue people. The kids went, after seeing a show that put them to sleep, they probably walked into the TV set. I fell they into loved it. it so they, much. Yeah, yeah, I mean, my background, you know, going to the University of Pennsylvania and the Annenberg School was a good segue into television. That's amazing because usually people come out of college and they have to put their time in. Yeah, you know, you know I mean, really put their time in and learn the ropes from a different angle. You were in production. Were, uh, were you creating or were you just producing those things? I was, you know what, I was <coughs> in research, I was very behind the scenes and I, what I really wanted to do was be creative, I wanted to create a right. show, so I, I, had, I came out here. And when you came out here, you did the family and the children's yeah. productions. Were you producing them or writing them? I was pretty much doing all of them, <laughs> all of it. I, I was kind of a schlepper when I first came out here. I didn't, I left everything behind in New York. Um, I was very determined. I was young. You I was did. fearless. You left everything, everything my everything, friends, family, apartment, sad apartment. But um, <laughs> you know, you're young. You have a certain energy, and you're, you're. I was fearless, so I went knocking on doors. I kind of had my shopping bag full of ideas, and I ended up hooking up with Chaim Saban. Oh, how did you get to, to Mr. Saban? Um, through someone I knew. I mean, basically, again, through that knocking. You know, you knock on doors. One of them is eventually going to going uh -huh. to open, and. Um, it was kind of... But that was the big power range yeah, time, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I was there right from the beginning. I mean, it, he hadn't yet, when I joined him, he had not yet created Power Rangers. And so how did you fit into this pattern? Um, 
how did I finish it? His, I just did what he told me to do, and I was, I, but I was, I was a believer, you know what? I, I mean, believed in him. Write? Were you writing? Yeah, I was writing, I was producing, I was, I was pretty much overseeing the episodes. A lot of them I created myself, some children's game shows ideas, like one was called I'm Telling, it was kind of newlywed game for brothers and sisters. I created Camp Candy with the late and great John Candy. Oh, yes. Um, so when you were working with Haim Saban and Power Rangers, did you continue writing? Were you doing episodes, TV episodes? Yeah, I wrote for Power Rangers. I was the supervising producer, which I oversaw all the, over all, sorry, all the oh, scripts. Oh. I oversaw the cast, the casting, their wardrobe, their wardrobe fights. Um, and I also wrote several episodes. Oh, you did? One, Where was that? Where were they filming that? Oh, they filmed them. It started in Culver City and then moved, then it ended up in Valencia. Most of them were in Valencia. Oh, they did? Yeah, and they went on location to different parks and, you know. So here you were, you were a staff of one, I mean, probably you had a huge staff, but you were staff. the one running everything. Uh, yeah, there were a couple of us, <laughs> but I had, you know, big, I had big responsibilities. I had to get those scripts ready, and they had to be shot five at a time. So it was, it was, it was a huge job. What happens to you when that finishes? You move on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you feel? Is it like a letdown? What happens? Uh, you know, it wasn't, you know, it was such a, you know, it was such a phenomenon. I mean, you go from, you know, we used to shoot in the park and no one would bother us. And then when that show hit the, hit the airwaves, I mean, kids saw the Power Rangers. It was amazing. Swarms. I don't know where these kids came from. I think they fell out of trees. They, they swarmed, saw them. They saw them swarmed. And it was all kinds of different offshoots of the Power Rangers. Yeah. I mean, they would go, I don't know who they were, but I some those, Power Rangers yeah, would go to parties yeah, and do entertaining exactly, at different exactly, places. Exactly, exactly. My stepchildren were Power Rangers for Halloween that year. Right, yeah. right. So. Well, so here we have you really busy in television and really involved. And then you write a novel. Well, <laughs> write a novel. I don't know. I don't ask. I, it's, you know, there's a, a pretty big gap between my production days and writing a novel. Oh, I, there is? There is some gap, yeah. I ended up going on to run a children's network at, at UPN, which is now part of Warner Brothers. Ah. And then I produced another show on my own. And then I had twin daughters and took... I have twin daughters, have to, Oh, yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, we'll have to talk. <laughs> are yours identical? They're fraternal. How about yours? Mine are identical. Oh, wow. So it's really interesting. Wow, wow. But so it does take three hands to raise two kids. Yeah, it takes more. I think it takes two, two, hand, two hands from each nanny. Exactly. <laughs> and Thanks. nanny. So I took some time off, and then I went back to work again. I, I ended up producing entertainment for a toy company for the Bratz, for the Bratz, uh, those fashion dolls, oh, the Bratz. Oh, yes, yes. Which I, which I loved doing because it kind of, it took my love for television and married it to my love for, my passion for fashion. That was very was interesting, fun. that group of uh, the, the, dolls the that came Yeah, out. I tend to work on these controversial things like I was Power say. Rangers, <laughs> Bratz. Um, so it, that was... A little that was, litigation in between. Yeah, a little litigation. <laughs> So that came to an, to an end, and I was kind of unemployed at that point. Had lunch with a dear friend of mine, and she told me about a friend who I knew who had just gotten this huge deal for, a book, for her first book deal. And I'm always the kind of person, hey, if she can do it, I can do it. <laughs> and that's pretty much how I've always operated. So I, you know, when I was back in TV, he could create a game show, I can create a game show. So I don't know. It just... That was kind of the impetus for me to, to write a novel. And I think back, how did this idea come about? I was going to say, where was the inspiration? It, it's, it's kind of vague in my head, but, but I'm a stepmom as well. And yes. I, was, I have two older children from my husband's first marriage, which I also went to. Um, I know, that was very bizarre. You went to his wedding. Yeah, I went to his first and wedding. And then you were in his second wedding. Yeah, I was, yeah it's, it's a little strange. <laughs> But I was going through a really, really challenging time with his son. I mean, really, it was really ugly. And I don't know, there was something in me, but I wanted to, de I thought I was like nice. I'm, you know, I'm not an evil stepmother here. And I had this urge to debunk the evil stepmother ah, myth. I got it right. And I honestly don't know how I made the leap to the premise of, you know, what if the evil queen from Snow White went to rehab and was given a second chance at Happily Ever After. And that was my premise, and that was my story. And you started what? You called it Dewitched. Yeah, I knew it was going to be Dewitched because she was kind of a witch. 
You know, uh -huh. I, I watched the Snow White movie again, and yeah, she's witchy. Right. She's witchy, and she goes to ther she goes to therapy for her addiction, and everyone. Every evil character is there. There's an alcoholic Captain Hook, anorexic Cinderella stepsister. So you use all of those all characters? Of, all of the, everyone's in there. Everyone's in there. King Midas is in there. The Emperor's in there. Um, Bambi's even in there. Everyone's and in I there. And I love it. The cover with the apple. Yeah, I, I love the cover. I love. And the you cover. write under E.L. Sarnoff. Yeah, I'm actually glad I did. Do people think you're a man? E.L.? No, because you know what? It's, it's online, you know, that uh, my name is Ellen Levy Sarnoff. You know, the reason I chose E.L. Sarnoff is because it just took up too much space. I'm an Ellen Levy Sarnoff. It <laughs> right. takes up too much space. Right. I didn't want my name on two lines. I don't know. It just, and also, there was also E.L. James out there. So, exactly. So I thought that was good. <laughs> so then you finished Dewitched and you went to Unwitched. Yeah, actually, I, I actually what wrote this book while I was editing this book. This oh, book did? was a really crazy process. How long did it take? Well, it took me six months with a break of a month in between to write the book. I wrote the second half of the book before I wrote the first half of the um, book. Because you knew everything. Yeah. You knew how it was all going to work, right? I, well, the, I knew how it was going to end. I had My first half of the book, she's in therapy. She's in rehab. I have never been in rehab, so I didn't really know <laughs> what rehab was. So I had to do some research and it comes freaking out, like what am I, how am I going to write about right. rehab? Right. But I don't know, I, I reviewed a lot of rehab, celebrity rehab centers and you know, I just got did it. Did you go to any workshops? No, you never. You didn't do any of no, that? No, I didn't. I, did. I read a couple of, I did self, I did read some books on how to write a novel. I wrote some chick, this is kind of a chick, what's called a chick lit. Uh -huh, you know, she's yeah. got a very snarky right. attitude. I was very inspired by Sophie, uh, Sophie Kinsella's Shopaholic series. Oh, right. I like that yes, style. Yes, of, yes. I like that style of writing. It's a similar style. I read some books on how to write chick lit, and some structure books, and, and that was it. It was a. It took me three years to, three years to edit. Oh, it did. Three oh, years. so that's why you were writing the other one uh, this, when you were yeah, editing. Yeah, this one's Did this other one come faster? It came a lot faster because you know in the process I had learned how to write a novel, which is a heck of a lot different than writing a script. Right. It's a lot longer a lot more words, a lot more typos, and you really have to learn how to show and not tell so the reader really can experience what your character is feeling. So we moved from de-witched to unwitched, and before we leave, the next book? It's going to be called Bewitched. So tell us, un unhitched is? Well, this one is, you know, she gets her happily ever after. She gets her prince. Right. And, and then the next one? Well, as we all know, there's no such thing as oh. a fairy tale marriage, right? <laughs> oh, unhitched. <laughs> unhitched, right. There's no such thing as a fairy tale marriage. And then, now what are you going to do? Well, the next one is going to be really interesting. It, this one ends up happily ever after, too. There's, there's some tragedy, but there, it, it ends up happily ever after. The next one's going to be really interesting. I've started writing it. It's very <laughs> challenging. It's going to be a time travel book. Oh. The, my, my fairy tale land is called La La Land. Anyway, my character, her name is Jane, um, makes a wish, and she ends up coming to, to La La Land, which is present-day Los Angeles. Fantastic. So she's got and she's going to be a Power Ranger <laughs> in La La Land. <laughs> <laughs> she Ellen. might meet one. She might meet one. <laughs> Ellen, thank you so oh, much. Thank you, John. This was so much fun. <laughs> thank thank you. you. And thanks for watching Ellen Levy Sarnoff and go buy her books. We'll be right back with Adam Silverman. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. And we're at the Hollywood Museum in Hollywood. I'm here with artist Adam Silverman, who was born in New York and raised in Connecticut. He graduated from Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, with two degrees, one in fine arts and one in architecture. He also knows about business because he earned a master's in business administration from UCLA. Adams had lots of great careers, but through the years, he's always made pots. Is that right? That All, right. I mean, you've, you've exhibited these pots in galleries and museums across the United States and in Japan. You've spent a lot of time in Japan. Why did your career start as an architect and not go right into pottery? That's a good question. 
Well, I started, I, I was making pots as a teenager, you know, in high school and summer camp. Like Did you have a people. ceramics department at your high school? Yeah, well, we had a fine art department that had a ceramics instructor and kilns. And I mean, in, in the 70s when I was growing up, that wasn't unusual, or I, at least where I was growing up. Uh -huh. Most schools, um, at least that I went to, even the public schools had a kiln and a wheel. And if you took a general art class, you got some ceramics. Um, but I went to a summer camp also that was an art camp that had glass blowing and oh. ceramics and printmaking and all sorts of... So um, you were really interested in the arts. Uh, I was. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs where there's not that much emphasis on art, but, um, but I was very close to New York City and most of my family, my aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins were in the city and I spent a lot of time in the city and my grandmother was an interior designer mm. and pretty cultured and... Um, you know, so but I, that I meant you went to museums, you were exposed. Right, no, I was to... exposed to things, uh -huh. um, although, you know, my day-to-day -day life in Connecticut was essentially s Wall Street and sports emphasis, as, you know, <laughs> a Connecticut suburb will right. do to you. Right, and to have somebody with tattoos from Connecticut is not the well, thing, Well, that's why you have to it? leave, you have to come to, <laughs> you have to move to Los Angeles. So, so you did take architecture, and you worked as an architect. I did. No, I, I, I I started school in the very beginning as a ceramics major and then discovered architecture and, and pursued architecture. And I loved studying it. It was a, it's a fantastic education. Well, did you study it in Japan? Is that why you went to Japan? No, I went to Japan after. Oh, um, but when I was studying, when I was in architecture school in the mid to late 80s, um, was when the kind of first wave, maybe not the first wave, the second wave of Japanese architects of influence kind of hit the American oh, shores. Oh. People like Tadao Ando. Um, who was now, you know, a huge... Isozaki was then. Isozaki was the same, I mean, uh -huh. uh, although a different style. Yeah, but, but, yes, but right, those, Isozaki, those right, Japanese that, art uh, right. architects were... So he, I mean, Ando in particular was very influential on me as a student, and when I finished school and I moved here, um, I made... A, my first trip to Japan was sort of an architecture pilgrimage to see buildings. Oh, it was. Um, and then... I had a second wave of time in architecture when I was I was in the clothing business. I was going to say when other career was fashion. Right. And, As, um, were you a designer? Well, I started the company with my college roommate, who was also a, a, an architect at RISD, oh. um, and we were both you know designers. And uh, in the beginning, we did everything together. And slowly, I sort of started doing more and more of the business side, and he did more and more of the design I side. See. And that's when I started making more and more pots because. The business the didn't keep you. The business wasn't keeping me happy, right? No, it wasn't keeping you happy, but right. it also so you were making time, I guess, for your pots. Where were you do, right. making that, them? At that point, I had a wheel and a kiln in, the stu in I, my garage. In your garage, I see. So because it wasn't easy to make them, you had to find the spot, you had to right. find a kiln, you had to the studio, the glazes. Right. Were all there in your garage? Yeah. And and now, where are they? Well, and then I set up a. Then I eventually set up my own real studio in Atwater in 2002, oh, oh. Um, out of the garage. And when I decided to become professional and you know really do, pursue it as a career, not as a hobby. And then, did you give up everything else? Yes. I mean, in all your other careers. Everything <laughs> in 2000, I gave up everything, um, and then by 2002, I committed to pursuing a career in potter. You're a, a potter, a sculptor, whatever. Both, or the same name, right? Yeah, I mean, it's all... Did, did you words. go to Japan to study it? Because it's a land of clay, really, Yeah, isn't it, it is. I haven't studied in Japan, but I have... I, I am lucky enough to exhibit in Japan a lot, and I have worked in Japan um, just through friends, uh, uh, fr friends of friends who I met there offered me um, the opportunity to use their studio oh, and work so there. Oh, so that was great. So I spent time there working, and, um, you know, it's phenomenally important experience. You talked about exhibiting in Japan. You've also exhibited at San Jose. What did you have Well, there? I had one, I did one large installation piece, which you guys may or may not have photographs of, um, to show that I did in collaboration with a friend of mine from college also, who is an architect in Boston, Nader Tarani. And it, it, the notion of the piece was that it would travel to different places and it would be reconfigured at, in response to the gallery or the space that and it was being exhibited clay. in. It's, it was 200 large clay cones that were oh. each cut into two pieces, so it became 400 pieces of varying sizes because they were cut at different levels. 
So at San Jose, that was installed. That was the first place that it was installed. Um, it was commissioned by an institution in Silicon Valley, so its first its so, first home was so San they Jose own it? Museum. No, actually, we own it. Oh, you own it. So um, you can so you can exhibit it anywhere. Yeah. So it went from there. It came to Mocha here, and it was oh, a different I configuration. See. And then it went to the Nasher. Oh, in Dallas. this was the same. Yeah. The same number. Mm -hmm, same so number. So you kept it all mm -hmm. in. It's just completely tact. different configuration in each place, so it looks different. Oh. And in the Nasher, it's installed outside in water, so it's very different than the right. white box galleries. The Nasher is buying it so it will stay at oh, so you'll, stay at the Nasher. They buy it from you then. Right. Oh the Na oh will it be up at permanently? Well you know actually they're going to um, reinstall it. It's been down. It was in the water for about nine months and then it's been out for at least Does a it year. hold up? It, ho it held up beautifully. Um, they're going to reinstall it when the Ken Price show goes there in Which the spring. Which will be great yeah. because I was going to say the Nasher is such a beautiful space and so it has beautiful. these gardens yeah. around it. Yeah. And I don't know where that fountain is. Is it in it's the It's in the back? back of the garden, right in front of the Terrell Sky piece. Oh, that'll be so great. It's an incredible company. It's between Terrell and Sarah. And then tell us, it is great company. Yeah. It, they'll all talk to each other at night. As Happy Price used to say, was, was saying when we went through the Ken Price exhibit, she said, when the lights go out, I know all these pieces oh, talk to nice. each other. That's really nice. And so you have a nice conglomeration of artists yeah, <laughs> to no, talk to. Yeah. Terrell. Sarah um, and Silverman. There's a Barbara Hepworth right next to her on the other side. Yeah, no, the company's fantastic. Oh, uh, that's great. So um, let's let's just talk about the Ken Price show because it's a ceramic yeah, yeah. show, and it will it's started at LACMA. Mm -hmm. It's going to the Nasher, and then it's, it'll be at the Met. Right. But the reason they're redoing this is because it relates, I guess. Your work relates to In the... In terms of reinstalling it. Yeah, uh -huh. I think that they think that there will be an audience that will be receptive. Right. You know, if you come to the Ken Price show, you may be receptive to this piece right. or vice versa. And you had another piece at the Kimball or was it the... Yeah, that was a very different piece. That was a piece, um, that is a piece that's about the Kimball specifically and it relates back to the architecture thing. Um, oh, the, and, and who is the architect? Well, there's the that? Louis Kahn, the original right. Louis Kahn building. There's a new building being built right now by Renzo Piano next to it it's part of the it's part of the Kimball but it's only connected underground so they sit separately on the site and then there's a Tadao Ando building behind it that's I the thought there was an modern. Ando yeah. it's a bit massive yeah. building it's it's a pretty great building the three of them you know so the three of them are sort of talking to each other at night as well and and there's a, a Roxy Payne there too there is the Roxy Payne tree, tree and there's yeah. a beautiful Richard Serra very tall um, yeah tower. that's beautiful yeah. right and he was very conscious of the Ando Khan link and talking to them with his piece which is between them. The the uh, Sarah Yeah the Richard Sarah it's piece. a it's sort of, I can't remember what it's called. It's a twisted torque thing that you walk in um, right. you know, sort of, and the sound is you, last time I was I was there a couple of weeks ago and there was a guy in there by himself playing cello. It was Oh phenomenal. you're kidding, yeah, how yeah. beautiful. Yeah, that's really great. Oh um, but the idea of that piece is that or the, the project is that I've been harvesting materials from the construction site of the Renzo building, oh. including clay, lots of different clays from the ground, and water from the fountains, and trees that I cut down from the site, and anything I could get that could somehow be turned into a pot or pots. Um, you made pots from so those I made, things? Right, so there are three large pots installed now at the in the courtyard of the uh, Kimball, the original building. And that's the Louis Kahn, the, the original. Louis Kahn. Oh, it's that's 40, fantastic. Right, it's super fantastic. Talk about it's being in great company. Really it's exciting. Yeah. yeah, because those buildings are so rich. Yeah. And then to hear that y you've gathered these things from the parts of what they're building there. Yeah, it's very symbolic and, you know. That's fabulous. And, and we want to talk about Edward Chella's show yeah. because that's a different kind of an installation. Mm -hmm. And he actually is wonderful right across from LACMA on yes. Wilshire Boulevard. But was he um, a design-driven gallery? Is he a design-driven well, gallery? Well, as I understand his history is he um, studied uh, architectural history and yeah. probably theory at, at Santa Barbara, I think pursuing a PhD, and then started dealing um, architecture books, rare books, and then drawings, and so sort of backdoored into the gallery world from books to drawings when architects were making drawings by hand. But he kind of understands thing. your work. Well, he understands my work. Now his gallery, he moved it here a couple of years ago, and it's called Edward Cella Art and Architecture. And since I've known him, um, which is 
going on two years, I think he hasn't had an architecture show. I think he's basically an art gallery at this point. But he does deal a lot of classic architecture drawings, like he'll have a Corbusier set of prints or right. Frank Gehry sketches or something like that. I've but seen those things there, and he's. But but you said when architects used to draw, now do well, they use computers? Yeah, I mean, I think the problem is architects of the generation that I'm part of, and then the newer ones, um, everything is on a computer, so it's it's almost. Um, they almost have to fake make something. Did you to draw? Sell. Did you I draw? drew. I'm the last generation the of. Last. I drafted with. Because I know Frank ink. Gary does. He right. draws because I've seen those right. funny little drawings. Right. And As if what do they mean really? Well, he's got people that interpret them <laughs> <laughs> and software. <laughs> and so the show at, at uh, Edwards. So the show at Edwards, it's two rooms in the gallery. The first room is pots. Um, and they're displayed on a very interesting and unusual table that was designed by an architect friend of mine, Kula Pat Yantrasast, who's a great architect in L.A. They're like it's, slants, it's, It looks... Um, it well, doesn't look like a table. It's pretty funny. It's, <laughs> it's almost like a, de, like a homemade wood aircraft carrier. Yeah, exactly. It's got you know, all these things. Right. But it's wood from a from a water tank, an old water tank in um, or from Oregon. And so they're big, beautiful, thick slabs of, I think, redwood that are 14 feet long, and then they're just composed in a way with the pots on them. And then the second room is sculptures. Uh -huh. So they're separated. And and before we leave, um, I know I drive by that Heath uh -huh. building, the building where Heath yeah, yeah. Ceramics uh -huh. is, and I keep saying, oh, that's so wonderful. When you go to a restaurant, they use heat yeah, ceramics, yeah. Uh -huh. or they say it on the mm -hmm. bottom of the menu. Yep. And you're there? I'm there. My studio is in the back of the store. And do you manage that? Um, so this, the, <laughs> very briefly, I'm a, what happened is I was here being a studio potter, and in 2003, Heath, which is a very old company, it's 60-something years old, 64 years old at this point, a young couple bought it from Edith Heath, and they started to revive it. I met them a few years later, and then we became sort of friends and started flirting and trying to decide on maybe doing something together. And in 2008, we decided we would build a new facility in L.A., and oh. I would become a partner in the company, put my studio in there, and it would be sort of an R&D kind of studio for the factory, which is in Sausalito. Oh, the factory's up north. Factory's up I north. See. So this is sort of an outpost with retail in the front. We have a little gallery space where we do different kinds of shows. Yeah, and, it's great. It's a wonderful little back. space. It's, it's great. It's been it's been a really good addition and, to the city. And it went back to your business management. <laughs> right, and 